Hi everybody. Greetings and salutations. Let's see if we can move a little quicker through this part of early Rhodesian history. 1890. A very busy year for the British South Africa Company. 1st of January. Formal signing here in Cape Town of a contract between the company and Frank Johnson whereby he undertook to construct a road from the border of Zambezia into Mashonaland up to a place uh, which Salou identified as Mount Hampton. Salou himself was appointed as, as guide of the, the column um, which would um, construct this road um, and also as its intelligence officer. Overseas, uh, the British government, I think, were having some concerns uh, about this occupation that was being planned and uh, it centered mainly around the fact that there was a, a Portuguese presence. The Portuguese accordingly were reminded that Zambezia was disputed territory and furthermore that there were certain conditions that had been laid out at the Berlin conference that Portugal hadn't really fulfilled. Um, so they were directed by the British. In fact, an ultimatum was issued. Please uh, remove yourselves from Zambezia now. Back home in Bulawayo, um, things were also happening. February, four uh, servicemen from the Royal Horse Guards arrived. Uh, bearing a letter from Queen Victoria uh, to King Lobengula. And their arrival created a great sensation. I mean, here were these men dressed out in number one uniform, um, these highly burnished, oh, what shall I call them, breastplates. There is a name for them, a military name. I can't remember what it is now. And um, they had come along to impress the Matabele people, and they certainly did. Everybody gathered around them, uh, trying to see their faces in these uh, burnished pieces of equipment that the, that the men wore. Well, Lobengula made them very welcome. Uh, he accepted the letter. Uh, what he actually thought of it, <laughs> I'm not so sure. Uh, it was very diplomatic and very polite. But for my part, I would rather that she hadn't um, tried to introduce African-sounding parables into the advice that she had for him. Uh, you know, after all, Lobengula was a past master at this. I mean, and, and he'd be able to see the real thing and the, the, the make-believe thing very easily. I, I don't think he was as good at it as uh, Francis Thompson, though. Thompson was one of the men uh, that negotiated the, um, the signing of the Rudd Concession. And Thompson was very good at uh, weaving African parables into his conversation with King Lobengula. And in fact, it was through this medium, largely, that he was able to convince the king to sign this document. Francis Thompson was really an expert. Um, and I think Queen Victoria's efforts fell considerably short of that high standard. Uh, nevertheless, I'm sure that King Lobengula uh, was uh, honoured to receive this, and I, I'm sure he must have kept that letter as a, as a prized momentum of that occasion. Well, the next day, these uh, four soldiers, uh, two officers, a corporal and a, a private, um, put on a display of uh, swordsmanship and everybody watched this uh, quite intrigued by these uh, mechanical movements that were taking place in front of them as these swords were waved around um, uh, impressive the european community at Bulawayo uh, felt that they didn't want to be left out so uh, they also got involved um, in the entertainment of that occasion they organized a horse race for the following day. Uh, track was laid out and four races were planned. Um, 
the Bulawayo Plate, the Zambezi Handicap, two other races, and then a, a final race um, for African participants only. And <laughs> this created a, a great deal of amusement uh, by everybody, everyone that was gathered there watching this. Because you see, the, the Matabele army was not a mounted army, they, they moved on foot. So here yeah, was an opportunity for them to, to try their skill at riding horses. Uh, <laughs> and as you can imagine, uh, it created a great deal of, uh, of fun and games. Um, the, they also introduced King Lobangula to this, this concept of betting on a horse. And um, he was delighted when the horse that he had chosen uh, won him a prize. So uh, he really enjoyed the day. Everybody did. And um, it just happened that all of this coincided with the annual great feast that the Matabili uh, held each year. Uh, and I've spoken about this, this feast before. But this particular year, ah, shame, poor Lobangula was really suffering from gout. The poor man could hardly hobble around. So the idea of him getting up and throwing his spear out into the felt, um, uh, that was dispensed with. He wasn't going to do that. But he did organize uh, a war dance uh, for his guests. Now, I, I have to say, for white people of my generation, living in Africa, we kind of view this, this with, a, with, a, with a fair amount of apprehension, I think. And the reason is that some time before the, the days that I'm speaking about, and not in Rhodesia, but in South Africa, there was a time when a treaty had to be signed as well. And the leader of the Boers, a man by the name of Petra Tif, had approached the, the king of the Zulus, uh, who was called Dingan. And uh, there were some tentative negotiations about signing an agreement whereby they could all live in harmony. And Dingan said to him, uh, Mr. Ratif, this is going to be a momentous occasion. Why don't you bring your families, bring all your women and your children, all your friends and all your followers, bring as many people as you like, because it's going to be for us a day of celebration when we sign this. Um, it's going to be a festive time. Won't you arrange that? And fortunately, uh, Ratif did not go that far as to make those arrangements. But on the appointed day, he arrived there with 100 of his followers on horseback. And they stopped outside the kraal where this ceremony was going to take place. And they were asked, would you mind leaving your weapons outside? You know, this is a, this is a day of peace. There's something special about it. We don't want weapons branded around. So, uh, okay. The weapons were left outside with a, a couple of men to keep an eye on them. And Ritif and his men moved into the crawl. The treaty was signed. Ratif rolled it up and put it in his jacket pocket. And then they all sat down next to the king to be entertained with a war dance. And this was arranged in such a manner that uh, the warriors performing this dance would be in ranks, in rows, in a big extended line, if you like. And the drums would beat, the men would stamp their feet, the ground would shake, um, there would be whistling, there would be chanting, and then they would move forward in unison, up to a point, and then they would stop and then retire. So while all this chanting was going on, chant, chant, chanting, backing and advancing, chanting, backing and advancing, and the drums were beating, and the Asa guys, that is the spears that they held in their hands, would be beaten against the shields to add to the, the noise. 
very spectacular, um, tremendous uh, spectacle. But it was so sinister in its design <clears throat> because it, it started off on that day as entertainment. They move back, they come forward and they move back. And there's all this noise, and this, this movement. And each time they come closer and each time the noise gets louder and each time the aggression is notched up. Remember, this is a war dance, hey? so nobody's smiling and grinning while they're doing this. So from entertainment, the visitors moved into a state of discomfort as these warriors got closer to them and retired. And from discomfort, it came to concern. And from a sense of, con of being concerned to alarm. And from alarm, I mean, it became panic and terror. And then Dingon rose to his feet and called out to the men. And then there was that final rush, sheer horror as the men realized that they had been trapped and they, would, they were going to be killed. And so they slew them all, all 100 of them. And Dingon had given orders that Retif was to be the last man put to death. He had brought his young son with him. And he wanted Retif to see with his own eyes how his men were slaughtered before him and his son as well. And then, then he perished. And a long time afterwards, when it was safe to do so, uh, others went there to go and retrieve the bodies. And in Retif's pocket, they still found this rolled up document with the king's mark on it. So this was the kind of thing that my generation were taught. We learnt it at school in history and many of us learnt it at home from our parents. In my case I learnt it from my grandmother. She related this to me when I was still quite young and I think for obvious reasons that I don't have to go into. So let's just leave all that there. I mention it because the Matabili people were an offshoot of Dingan's people. So here in Bulawayo, I mean, every Matabili there knew this story, as well as every European in Bulawayo knew the story. And so when this war dance was organized, I don't think you can blame anybody for remembering what happened back there in Dingan's crawl. But that wasn't the purpose that they were gathering. This was going to be entertainment and nothing else. But I'm sure that those um, guardsmen would have been appraised of that little piece of, of African history. And, uh, and it, they would have been told, listen, don't just think that you're going to walk into Bulawayo and you, you, you're showing the flag. You're representing the Queen and there's all this pomp and ceremony and that's all that there is to this. There is still a little element of risk in all of this. So mind your manners, your P's and Q's and, uh, and be aware um, of where you are. Not everybody in Bulawayo is happy with this, uh, this concession. There's a lot of anger among some people, some of the Indunas. So just be aware. And so they all sit down next to Loban Gula, all his guests and um, the Matabili warriors form up and they begin their dance. And it is, as I explained earlier on, as the Zulus danced, so did the Matabili. Not much difference between these two nations. Backing and advancing, chanting, chanting, drums beating. And I think what must have... Uh, maybe worried some of the European guests there was the fact that at some point Jamison who was still in Bulawayo at that time he he excuses himself and he's not there with them 
And as these warriors are moving and singing and stamping their feet, there's a roar from the crowd. And the warriors part. And who should we see there standing amongst them is none other than Dr. Jim himself, Jemison. Stark naked except for his ostrich feathers and uh, a skirt of animal tails around his waist. And there he is. He's dancing with the African warriors. Remember I said on, uh, on an earlier occasion that he was an Induna. So here he was with his men, with his regiment, uh, entertaining Lobangula's guests. And it brought the house down. It broke the ice at that party. Everybody was laughing. When the dance was over, he ran over, flopped down next to uh, Lobangula there, out of breath. And uh, <laughs> gaspingly he said, come on Ngozi, uh, you got to admit, eh? we're having a good time. And now is the right time for us to talk about Mr. Rhodes. You know, we're going to build a road, eh? Through your country right up to Mashona land. And the king laughed and said, Yeah, oh, Jim, I know. I know you guys. He said, Yeah, you've got no objections, eh? You must talk now. So he said, No, I've got no objections. I'll tell you what, Jim. I'll give you 100 of my warriors to go and help you build that road. What do you think about that? And Jamison said, are you serious? He said, yeah, 100 of my men, my best men. I'll send them to go and build the road for you. Is that a deal? See, it's, it's the beer talking, you know, a lot of beer at these occasions. So uh, Jamison is delighted. And all those festivities end on such a very good note. It's like the old Bulawayo before this problem with the concession reared its head. Uh, everybody getting on with each other, everybody friendly. And so uh, Jamison leaves and he goes back and then plans are now made to form this column and to now move into Zambezia. Now, I don't want to spend any time on this and I'll tell you why. Because there is somebody who can who can tell the story of the column a lot better than I can. Somebody far more knowledgeable than I am. Go on to YouTube, please, if, if you're interested in the detail of that. Uh, and just look for Jill Baker. Jill Baker. You'll see a lot of movies come up over there. Just choose whatever title and whatever subject takes your fancy. And, and just listen to this good lady. She really knows her stuff. She's easy to listen to and uh, it's fascinating uh, the information that uh, that she has there and listen especially to what she has to say about the column um, I find it very intriguing if if you'd rather read go on to Google and I hope I've, I've, I've got the, the title of this paper right. I think I have. It's a very simple, short title. I think it's Rhodesia 1890. That's all. And it's by a man called uh, Skipper Host. Uh, Host was an ex-steamship uh, captain uh, who became acquainted with Rhodes. And uh, he was a, a, an officer uh, on the Pioneer Column. And this paper is his journal, the day-to-day -day events that took place. It is, it is really, really, really good uh, stuff. Uh, it's, it, it's meat that you can get your teeth into if you, if you like studying it. So, um, you know, I can't do better than to direct you to those two sources. So I, I'm not going to speak about the column. Uh, uh, there you have it. And I, and I, I, I hope that that you'll find it as I have explained it to you. But let me just say this, that um, Sulu, of course, was guiding the column. And he got to a certain point um, where he was to meet uh, Johan Kolenbrander with the 100 promised Matabili warriors who were going to come and help. And man, they, you know, we could really have used them. 
and they're not there. These Africans don't pitch up. So Salou gets going and he, he makes his way over to Bulawayo and he arrives there eventually, asks for an audience with the king and he says, Nkosi, I have come to ask you for the men that were promised to help us build the road. They did not arrive as had been arranged. And Lobangula says, you're not getting any men. I'm not allowing you to build a road. So he says, but you know, how can you not allow us to build a road? You've given us permission to go and look for gold, to explore the country there. Uh, how can we move our equipment and stuff? And Lobangula says to him, there's a road into the country. There's a road that runs right past Bulawayo. You want to come into the country? You come along the road where I can see what you're doing. So he said, but Nkosi, <clears throat> you know, there are very good reasons why we have to build the road where we are building it. And all the plans have been made. Um, you, you know, what can be your reason for, for objecting to this? So Loban Gula replies to him, not in my words, but to the same effect. And he says, Mr. Zalu, have you stopped for a minute to ask yourself, why is Kruger so quiet these days? Uncle Paul has, has got nothing to say about the plans of the company. He's just keeping quiet. Why do you think that is? Let me help you out here. He's going to leave you to build that road. You're going to build that road, as you said, all the way into Mashona land. He's going to make you do all the hard work for him. Let me tell you something. We like you a lot better than we like the Boers. But we are more frightened of the Boers than we are of you. Because we know that you can't handle them. When that road is finished, Kruger is going to cross over and he's going to use that road. He's going to sweep you people out of the way. There'll be no more BSA company here in, 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 in Zambezia. What's he going to do when he gets to Mashona land? I'll tell you. He's going to join up with the Portuguese. So now I'm going to have a combined force of Portuguese and Boer warriors that I've got to deal with because they will be marching on to Bulawayo. And all because of this road that you want to build. And you want me to approve that road. I'm not approving that road. I want to allow you to build the road. There is going to be no road. End of story. Go back and tell the company. So, <clears throat> Salu leaves and they have a hurried meeting, uh, the company. And it's decided, look, there's only one man who can ever speak reason to the king, and that's Jamison. He'll have to go back. So, Dr. Jim makes his way back to Bulawayo, but the king is in no mood to talk. The old days of backslapping and making jokes and laughing together are gone now. And um, Jameson tries his best. He, he tries to convince Loban Gula he must change his mind about this road. Loban Gula doesn't want to hear about it. Zero response from him. After a couple of days, Jameson sees he's getting nowhere. So he has one final conversation with Loban Gula and he says, Nkosi, it's time that I must speak very straight to you. We need to, to understand each other very well on this matter now. There must be no misunderstandings. We are going to build that road, whether you like it or not. And if you send your warriors to stop us, if they attack us, you must understand what I'm telling you now. We can look after ourselves. We will fight back. And there's going to be blood spilt. And it will be your fault if you've sent them in there. Don't try and stop us. That's all I've got to say on this matter. And so he leaves. He notices before he leaves that the Martini Henry rifles that were uh, part of this whole transaction, a thousand weapons are still in their cases. There's a canvas cover over them. Lobangula won't touch them. But that's, Jameson's not concerned about that. 
uh, he goes back and he says, I can't make any headway with him. So the column starts off and uh, Logan Gula, you know, he sends messages from time to time saying, I'm trying to keep my warriors in check. I can't be expected to to hold them back any longer. You people must turn around and go back, leave the country. Falls on deaf ears. Nobody pays attention. They are under observation all the time by the Matabili. They are just almost out of rifle shot, if you like, and they are watching what's going on. But no attack takes place. Anyway, the column gets to a certain point. Um, it's near its uh, its destination now, and uh, one morning, uh, everybody's called together, and Salu announces that uh, he's resigning at this point. He has something else that Rhodes wants him to do, so he's going to leave the column here. And uh, the rest of the way is easy, and he hands over the work of being the guide to a Mr. Burnett, a good scout. And um, he leaves with Jamison and with a man called Cahoon and some troopers. And now they're going to go eastwards because they have to find a chief by the name of Mutasa. And they need to speak to him. You see, Mutasa lives in, in a place called Manika land. So far, I've spoken about Matabili land. I've spoken about Mashana land. And now we've got Manika land. And Manika land is on the east. So, uh, and that is where the Portuguese are, you know, trying to really exert their influence. Now, <laughs> between you, me, and the gatepost, <clears throat> at that time, really Manica land uh, belonged to, to Portugal. But okay, we're going to see if we can do something about maybe getting them to leave there, if they are there. But on the way, Jamison falls off his horse. Oh, man. He hurts himself so badly that he's he's got to go back to the column. So it's Salu, Cahoon, and the remaining troopers off to Chief Mutasa's crawl. And they arrive there. They introduce themselves. Salu says, we're from the BSA company. Uh, we have permission to come into the land. Lobangula has given us this, and uh, now we want to speak to you. Um, we'd like to find out where you stand with the Portuguese. Ah, Portuguese. No, no, I've got nothing to do with Portuguese. No, no, but we believe that you're signing treaties with the Portuguese. No, it's not true. Utasa says, cut off my hand. You can cut off my hand. I'll never tell you a lie. What do I know about Portuguese? So they say, well, we're very happy to hear that. Uh, if that's the case, then, would you have any objections to coming to some arrangements with us? We'd like to build a railway line through this part of the world, uh, some roads, bridges, certainly, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, would you be interested? C can we make an agreement between ourselves? Yeah, sure. Well, <clears throat> what would you want in return? Oh, I don't know. What do you suggest? Or would you like a few rifles? Yeah, rifles is nice. So they leave some weapons there with him. Oh, such an insignificant amount. Uh, I, I read somewhere, I think it amounted to something like about, a, uh, in value, a hundred pounds, which is nothing uh, for a treaty. Uh, it was really a gift more than anything else. So before they leave, Mutasa says, Mr. Salu, you know, I haven't been entirely honest. The Portuguese do come here from time to time, but, but don't worry about that. My problem is, uh, and I've got a complaint here, I have a lot of trouble with the Changans. Can't you help me? Can't you keep them away from me here? Sulu says to him, you know what, Chief? When you signed that agreement with us, all your troubles are over. The Portuguese come here and give you a pill. The Changans come here and give you up hill, no problem. You just send word to, to us, we'll come sort them out for you. Don't worry. So on that happy note, everybody says goodbye. The column proceeds. They don't go as far as Mount Hampton because they find a better spot near a hill called Arari. 
and uh, they named that place Fort Salisbury. They raise the flag, they fire the guns, they do everything that history tells us that they did over there. And now we have uh, formally occupied Zambezia. In the meantime, back there in Manica land, <clears throat> the Portuguese hear of this agreement that's been made with Mutasa. And they're not really impressed about this because, according to them, uh, Mutasa has sworn allegiance to Portugal. He's, he's not free to go and give parts of Manicoland away for railways and bridges and stuff to the British. So it's decided that they better go and get to the bottom of this thing. So they leave uh, Masakes, which is a fort, and that's the way it was pronounced in those days. And uh, they move up to Mutasa's Kroll. This is now a Lieutenant Colonel Andrada with his second in command, his 2IC. And uh, about 200, uh, some estimates were a lot more, but I've taken the lower figure, about 200 Askaris. In this case, these were um, indig indigenous troops uh, from Angola that had been brought over to support him. So they arrive at Mutasa's Kral, and this is going to take a few days now to sort out this whole thing and get him to understand and find out to what extent has he agreed to what there. This all takes place on the top of a hill. Somebody hurries over to Salisbury, quite a distance, uh, with the news that the Portuguese have arrived and are harassing uh, Mutasa. So Cahun, the man who had gone there originally, has been appointed as the administrator of Mishana land. Everything is now in his hands. He's the highest um, civilian official there representing the company. So he gets hold of uh, Captain Forbes and he says, Forbes, take some men, uh, ride like the devil to Manica land, and go and see what's going on there with the Portuguese. Forbes does just that and he arrives there uh, a bit later after a, a dash from Salisbury to Manica land uh, and he finds that Andrade is still there but uh, <laughs> Andrade has allowed his Ascaris to take a break at the bottom of the hill so there are these 200 men they're lying on their back they've been there for a few days dozing in the sun, nothing's happening, there's nothing for them to do. Their boss, the colonel, is on top of the hill speaking to the locals. They haven't got a care in the world. No sentries, posted, nothing. The next thing they know, they're staring down the guns of uh, Captain Forbes's men. And it's... So without a shot being fired and hardly a word being spoken, these Ascaris are disarmed. Forbes then starts climbing the hill and uh, when he gets to the top with his men, the sentries there are absolutely taken completely by surprise. Before they can say Jack Robinson uh, in Portuguese, <laughs> they are disarmed too. And Andrade is standing there and he's talking and he's trying to explain everything. Mutasa's there with all his sub-chiefs and, and they're all listening to Andrade. He doesn't see the company men behind him. The next thing he knows is they grab his arms, pull this behind his back and the handcuffs are put on his wrists. His 2IC makes a run for a horse. He, he just barely gets on it when he's grabbed by the pants and pulled down onto the ground. So the two of them have now uh, been arrested and they're held captive. Forbes doesn't leave it at that. And he, he decides that he's going to advance on Masakesi, which he does. Uh, he takes his men and the fort there, upon his arrival, immediately just surrenders. Captain Forbes now sees an opportunity for him to move right into Mozambique. But his, his, his plan 
is to advance right up to the port of Byra and capture it. It's a long way to go, uh, but he's determined to do this. And if he can do it, he will have uh, divided uh, Mozambique into two, and we would have that whole center section as a wide corridor, uh, Rhodesian territory, and our own coast, and our own ports. And uh, it's an opportunity that he, he cannot let slip because he knows Rhodes wants this. Uh, we all want it. The country wants it. And so he sends some men back to escort Andrade uh, and his 2IC off to Salisbury. He leaves some men at uh, Fort Masikesi and then he moves deeper into the country. He's able to go 150 miles before he has to uh, dismount uh, and leave his horses uh, because of the the tropical diseases that they have in that part of the country and it just decimates animals. So from there on, uh, it's on foot. And he leaves a couple of guys there to to serve as a line of communication. He's now got six troopers left, that's all, and it's himself, seven men. They are now going to attack the garrison at Byra. And, um, of course, all of this takes time. And even though in those days, uh, you know, communications are, are nothing to what they are by comparison with today. I mean, that sort of thing would have been known instantly in, in Lisbon and in London. Uh, it wasn't then. But it did get to the Portuguese government's ears that they were losing Mozambique. And they, in turn, got hold of the British government in London. And there was a great amount of dissatisfaction and unhappiness from both sides over Forbes's action. And um, a hurried uh, message was sent to Colhoun in Salisbury from the British government. They were beside themselves with anger. And it was explained to them, uh, to the authorities in Salisbury, you guys can't go around annexing countries. This kind of thing causes wars. Yeah, well, we know that. <laughs> if you think you've got problems with us, with Mozambique, <laughs> wait till you see when we tried to annex annex the Boer Republic of South Africa, then you really had a war on your hands afterwards. But at the time, uh, Colhoun felt that he better comply. So he hurriedly scribbled down some orders to Forbes, telling him to stop where he was and to turn around and come home. And on the envelope, he explained that this was a, a very urgent and critical message that must, must be got through. And, and his exact words were, no man or horse is to be spared in the delivery of this letter. Well, it got to central Mozambique. And if I'm not mistaken, the same host I mentioned earlier on, uh, the elderly officer, had been left there by Forbes. And later on he said, do you know, if I had known what was inside that letter, I would not have sent it on to Forbes. Um, I would have delayed it until he had captured Byra. Because at that time, Forbes was now on the Pungwe River. And not the next day, but certainly the day after, he would have been in Byra. And his intention was to tell the garrison there, lay down your arms and get out. If you don't, I kick you out. Now, he had come into Mozambique and everybody had fled before him like fish in front of a shark. So Forbes had the full expectation that the garrison there at Byra would, would clear out. And commentators afterwards have said, yeah, you know, we agree with him. We think uh, the Rhodesians would have, call, uh, you know, would have captured that port. When Forbes gets the, the order to stop and turn around, he is so angry. And who can blame him? Man, so close, so close. 
But uh, he was a Sanders trained officer. He could give orders, but he also knew how to take them and obey them. So he turned around and came home. Oh, you know, <clears throat> so near yet so far. And what a difference it would have made if we had been able to to conclude that operation uh, by annexing that, that part of Mozambique. Uh, you know, I, I don't say these things lightly. I know that they they are serious matters. But, you know, we really believed that um, our need was greater than, than Portugal's. We had a, a brand new country that we wanted to open up. We needed a route to bring equipment and materials in and to get our stuff out later when we had you know got our minds going uh, and also and I say this with the deepest of respect to to our Portuguese friends um, we, we believed that we could do a better job there than uh, they had been able to up until that point um, and I, ho I hope <laughs> that they will accept our apologies we are very sorry that we had a go at you. But man, you know, sometimes you just got to do these things in life, you know. Um, <clears throat> I think we made up for it afterwards. I don't think there's been any hard feelings. Uh, every public holiday, certainly in, in my time, <laughs> we would all flock down to Mozambique and invade the country again and take over the place. Uh, for, for many, it would be the vino there. For others, it would be the prawns. For others, it would be the bullfights in Lorenzo Marx. Uh, and for others, like in my case, it was just simply camping on the beach at Byra. Oh, I remember a bakery they had there. They produced the most delicious bread rolls. I think they called them milk rolls. Everybody spoke about it. So, yeah, we all have very happy memories of uh, our relationships with the Portuguese in, in Mozambique. So... Um, I, I trust that they feel that we have made sufficient amends as the years went by. Uh, when they were faced with the bush war there, uh, our defence force uh, was very quick to come to their aid. Our RLI was on the ground there uh, with their troops. And um, yeah, it, it was something that just didn't work out, the annexation of uh, Mozambique. But uh, if it had... Just imagine this, eh? If there had been a wide corridor down through that country, I think that it may have served the Portuguese a lot better than they thought that it would at the time. I mean, a northern and a southern Mozambique with Rhodesia in the middle of it. I think southern Mozambique would have held firm during the Bush War. It would have had uh, Rhodesia on its northern border, Rhodesia on its western border, South Africa on its southern border. And I think with that protection, um, they would have been able to get through that. Um, Northern Mozambique, I don't think that place would have lasted very long. But Rhodesia would probably have been even stronger as a nation than we were. You know, with our own seafront and our own ports, uh, I, I think we would have been a more prosperous country, um, perhaps more developed. And although it's, it's a bigger uh, frontier to patrol, uh, I think we may have been better placed to deal with all of that. And as for the gooks then, I mean they never found it easy to deal with us, but I think they would have found it a little bit more difficult. So it's a pity that didn't really happen. And can you imagine the stories for a minute? Hey? <laughs> Rhodesian ships going toe to toe, exchanging broadsides with a blockading fleet. Oh, and, and, and <laughs> whose fleet would it be? Oh, can you just imagine the British government holding their heads in their hands over there over the Rhodesia question? Ah, oh, now we've got to send... Oh, we, our Navy can't engage those men. We're going to have a mutiny on our hands. Our, our sailors won't fight against them. It's kith and kin. Oh, I can just imagine all that kind of stuff going on. <laughs> it never happened. Uh, you know, when Forbes got back to Salisbury, <clears throat> he was a hero. You know, the, the fact that he had a go. He tried, uh, but he wasn't successful. But Cahoon, oh, his name was Mud. <laughs> Even Jameson said, I can't believe that I actually gave that man his job. 
he's gone and stabbed us in the back by bringing Forbes back. You know, we could have had Byron now. Um, but the man of the moment for me was Lieutenant Colonel Andrada. And I've got to finish here uh, just relating the story about this man. After Forbes captured him, okay, uh, he hadn't met him face to face at that point. And so somebody called Forbes over and he, and he said, Captain Forbes, I'd like to introduce you to Colonel Andrada. Colonel Andrada, this is Captain Forbes. And Andrada took one look at Forbes and in indignation drew himself up to his full length. <laughs> and he said, Captain Forbes, you are a scoundrel, sir. And from henceforth, dogs in every street, at the mere mention of your name, will start to bark. <laughs> I love it. Have you ever heard a more civilized insult? <laughs> Oh, dear me. Oh, well, it's all another chapter in the Rhodesian story. Uh, so many interesting characters. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, not to his face, but behind his back, uh, would point at Forbes when he walked past, say, that man, he's got the bravery and the brains of a bulldog. <laughs> bulldog Forbes. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think we'll stop there. Eh? Uh, I've, I've, I've said enough. It feels to me like a long episode. Uh, so I'm just going to leave it right there. Uh, folks, until we meet again next time. Uh, thank you again for your interest. Thank you for even bothering to listen to me. Uh, I, I'm honored. I, I appreciate it. I hope you in, enjoy uh, hearing about uh, my country and uh, keep safe, um, look after yourself. We will speak again soon, I trust. Cheers for now. <laughs>